we'll get started. Again, welcome to the Center of the American Experiments Agenda 2022 session on the session priorities and session happenings for the, for the session coming up, which starts next week. My name is Bill Walsh. I'm the uh, Director of Communications for the Center. And for those of you who don't know about the Center, let me just do a quick plug. Uh, we're a think tank, a public policy think tank here in Minnesota. We like to call ourselves Minnesota's think tank. It's everything you think it would be as when you hear the word think tank. Uh, we have public policy fellows in education, energy, healthcare. We have a couple of economists on staff. We just hired a new person in a new area of public safety. That's kind of unfortunate that, that the state of Minnesota needs to work on public safety so much, but we did just expand there. So we write a lot, we post a lot on our website, AmericanExperiment.org. Um, we also are more than just a think tank. We, we do a lot of advocacy. We have our campaigns that we run, we do some advertising. We try to move the ball. We try to influence policy here at the Capitol. And so I think you'll see a lot of our campaigns out there. Uh, another plug while I've got the microphone, um, if you're interested in this seminar today, you might be interested in our weekly newsletter that talks about just what's going on at the Capitol. It's called Capitol Watch. If you go to mncapitalwatch.com, you can uh, sign up for that. We send it out every Sunday night, kind of looks back at what happened, but also previews what's going to happen at the session. I hope and I like to think it's an inside kind of story, inside look at what's happening at the Capitol. So that's my plug. I'm going to introduce our panelists in a second. Just the format, we're going to talk for about 45 minutes about a list of uh, items and agenda things that are happening here at the Capitol, and then hopefully we'll open it up for questions. So if you have questions, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Click on the Q&A button, uh, drop your question in there. Got some staff in the room, my colleagues, that'll, that'll text me some questions as they come. So if I'm looking at my phone, it's not that I'm disinterested in what the panelists are saying. I'm trying to prepare for the, for the Q&A. <laughs> I will not be playing games on my phone. So I'm uh, really grateful to be joined by a couple of uh, uh, representatives here at the Capitol. On my left, uh, Representative Kristen Robbins represents Maple Grove in the House. And on my right, Senator Mark Johnson represents uh, Northwestern Minnesota, Thief River, Crookston, East Grand Forks. And I'll let you guys introduce yourselves and maybe a little about your district and then uh, maybe a follow up on that. So sure. you want to go first, Senator, since you're the host. Thank you for letting no. us use your office. <laughs> thank you very much. No, it, it's the people's office. So hopefully that'll be, uh, you know, maybe this year, maybe next year, people may actually have to to come back into their office. So, uh, no, I'm Mark Johnson, state senator from Northwest Minnesota. I have the six counties in Northwest uh, Minnesota. They accuse me and say I'm the Canadian senator, uh, which isn't too far off. But uh, so I live up there with my wife, you see Skyler. see Canada from your back porch. That's exactly <laughs> it, yes. Uh, so uh, my wife, Skyler, and our three uh, kids up there, uh, 10, 6, and 8. Uh, so we've got, we got all the the kid things going on up there right now. Um, but yeah, just a great community to be from. Uh, I'm a lawyer, uh, concrete worker, and now legislator and, and loving the job down here. Uh, last few years have been a real, real challenge with the COVID issues, but uh, I think we're getting, we're getting a handle on that uh, to some degree uh, and moving forward. And but, and in the capital, sometimes uh, uh, proximity to power, but it, but is is a thing. And so we're sitting in your office, right next to the majority leader's office here. So you have a leadership position in this caucus right now. Yeah, I'm uh, assistant deputy leader. So. All right, good. So Representative Robbins, introduce yourself in your district. Thank you. I'm Representative Kristen Robbins, and I represent half of Maple Grove, all of Rogers, and all of Dayton. So that northwest corner of Hennepin County in the legislature. I was first elected in 2018, and um, I'm very happy to be here. Our, our house office building is not open to the public, so we couldn't do this in my office, but I hope that will change um, in, the, in the coming weeks, and um, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Well, let me, let me get into that in a minute, because I want to talk about the access to this building, but before we do, just, just on, um, I, I like to ask some representatives this sometimes. I think we get down here sometimes at the Capitol, and you get caught up in all the issues, but you forget why you ran in the first place. So, what drives you? What, what drove you to run in the first place? And what drives you, you know, to, to be in the legislature right now? Because you could do a lot of other things with your time. I mean, I think all of us want to make a difference. And that's for both sides of the aisle. I think people come here and really want to serve their communities, serve their constituents, and put forth policies that will really help Minnesota grow and be competitive. So I got in um, sort of by happenstance. I didn't have a plan to run the former um, House Majority Leader Joyce Pepin stepped down and took a job in the private sector and it just opened up the seat. So I kind of just threw my hat in at the last minute and it worked out, but it wasn't, you know, some big long-term plan. Okay. Mark, you get up on Sundays and have to take about your kids and family. Sometimes you bring them down, but you make a long drive, a five and a half hour drive down here. What drives you to come down to the Capitol for the week uh, for six months out of the year? 
Yeah, and mine goes back a little bit further. Uh, 2008, I, I came, I was down at IBM as a financial analyst, and I want to go back to the family business of concrete. Well, 2008, as everybody remember, was a terrible time. That kind of shows why my, my time in investing, uh, you know, it's kind of bad. But so I went back home, 2008, there was a, you know, the crash, we just struggled and struggled for three, four years uh, to try to get back onto our feet as a company. And right the first year that we actually made a little bit of money, um, and I thought, well, I can actually, you know, put a roof on the house again because we need some reshingling or do, or do something, you know, for my wife or do that. Then all of a sudden the tax bill came, completely wiped out all the earnings that we had for that year. I said, there's got to be a better way to do this. You know, it just, it hit us so hard as a family that here's government reaching into our pockets after years and years of struggle, finally being able to make something and then it's all gone again. And that got me into the process of getting in touch with our BPOUs and, and just working through the process. And finally, there was an opportunity in 2016 uh, to run. And I took that opportunity because I wanted to make some, some real change down here in St. Paul. Yeah, good. So the building, I want to talk about that a little bit because we had to stop uh, at the security office and the Senate office building to get in today. Well, and that's just because it's you, though. No, no. no I, think, I think they do that for everybody. Oh, okay. I can't confirm that, but 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 I think most people. So we stopped in security. We had to call and get an escort to get up on the second yeah. floor where the offices are. And understanding the Senate's going to be a little different. Than so maybe tell us what's going to be the, the the format for the public to come watch the Senate, and then we'll come to the House next. Sure. Well, we'll start with with the big house over here behind us. That's going to be wide open, so people can come in as they always have. Uh, and meet, you know, you'll see your legislators. You'll you'll be able to see the happenings, what's going on there. So you can send a note be, into a congress or to a senator. Uh, from my understanding, yeah, okay. you'll be able to do that, uh, and we'll be able to come out like we always have been. Uh, there's conference rooms there, so we can always pull a conference room, first come, first serve, go, you know, meet and chat there. So we've we've got a real opportunity there. Then we move over to the Senate building. Now that gets to be a little bit more locked down. So second and third floor, that's the protocol that we're going to have to go through. It sounds like is that we're gonna to have to probably escort you up here if you wanna come into the office, but we're being encouraged uh, to open up the first floor where all the meeting room, rooms are, the conference rooms, the hearing rooms, um, and we can do meetings down there So there's a well. hearing, a public hearing, at least the public can watch the public. That's hearing. my understanding right now. It, and they're gonna be in-person hearings with senators. Actually. Absolutely. We are doing a big, big effort to be in person, to be here. That's the only way that this democracy, well, you mentioned that earlier, democracy works is that we're talking, we're here in person, and this, you know, two years of Zoom, I, yeah. I, it's, it's over. And your speaker is not there yet. Uh, no, <laughs> the house is still shut down. House. So I'm, I'm very disappointed about it. The house, um, again, as the senator said, the Capitol is open. So I plan to be on the house floor every time we're in session. And we will have meeting rooms available where we can meet with constituents. And some colleagues and I are thinking we're going to bring some card tables over and just set up a little area where our constituents can come and meet with us. But our office building, the house office building, is going to be closed to the public and possibly even to our staff on a regular basis. Our staff currently isn't in there regularly. So um, it's very very bad for democracy. And the speaker sent a letter to uh, the sergeant in arms and the Department of Administration outlining some changes she wanted to ensure the safety of the members and staff. And I have to say, as a member, I don't think we're any less safe now than we were before COVID. I feel very safe in my office. I feel safe when the public is coming through. And I think it's really bad for democracy that the public will no longer just be able to come and roam the state office building, roam around, see who's in their office, stop in and say hi, come to hearings. All of our hearings are gonna be remote on Zoom, yeah. which is really hard for people to testify. Last year, I had people signed up to testify and if you run out of time for the Zoom meeting, your witnesses just don't get to share their point of view and we as members don't get to ask as many questions when it's not in person. So I feel like this is really unfortunate for democracy and, and the public's access to the legislature and really being able to follow what's going on. And don't you feel like that almost puts a, a layer of glass between you and your constituents, people that you're actually supposed to represent? It just, it's like you don't have that contact anymore with them. Before it was so visceral. They're in your right. office, they they're right in. here. Let's have that relationship. But now it's just, it's just, you know, it's just disconnected right. And so I think much. it's unnecessary. I, I yeah. don't feel any threat. I did it before COVID. I certainly don't think it's worse or different now. Um, the sergeant at arms does a fantastic job. There are state patrol, state troopers here all the time. Yeah. I, I personally 
feel like it's really a mistake yeah, to we'll go have, down this route. Well, have members and staff in the house, you know, uh, having a, uh, their, their um, behind closed doors, COVID meetings all day. And then you'll see them at the wild game on uh, later that night, you know, with, with everybody else and, uh, you know, having a drink and watching the hockey game. So maybe your first uh, layer of advocacy is to call the house and, and the Senate too, I think, because I don't think they're fully open to, to my standards. And tell them to open up, open up the house so we can have some advocacy because I think it, it's not good for democracy. Like said, okay, let's get to issues. Enough, uh, enough. For it. It. So the, the big issue, obviously, seven point seven billion dollar surplus. Uh, people watching this uh, webinar obviously know about that. Um, I'll, I'll make some news. We're going to announce from the center um, a huge campaign, a give it back campaign uh, later this week. We're going to kick it off uh, as a way to, to let you guys know that uh, the public wants the money back. It's our surplus. Give it back. So you're going to see that campaign launch soon, but why don't we just start on the positive? What are you just came from a caucus uh, of senators meeting? Uh, are they talking about what to do, how they're going to give it back? Let's just assume we're going to get some back. How is the Senate Republicans going to give the money back? We're going to give it back in Miller money. We're going to call it. <laughs> you know, we're going to triple those those walls checked. No, that's not how we're going to do it. So the Democrats are very concerned about individual groups, of course. I mean, it's their whole woke culture. They they see frontline workers as a new victim group. That's where they're heading. They want to get a billion dollars out to what they call frontline workers. These are just a wide, wide group of, you know, truck driver, whatever it is for a pittance. Uh, they're going to try to do that. So we think all Minnesotans deserve uh, some tax break. We see $7.7 .7 billion. Okay, well, apparently our tax rates are too high for this state, right? I mean, that's just common sense. So let's look at our bottom marginal rate. You know, in, in the state of Minnesota, we could reduce that. It would help all Minnesotans. So it's not just $165 or whatever the, the balls check would one be. time. One time. This would be month after month, compounding year after year of, of savings that people are actually able to put back into their pocket. You know? So you're looking at the lower rate? Let's look at the lower rate. I think that makes a lot of sense, trying to get that money back into the individual's pocket. The other thing we have to do, we, we just have to look at, we got to find a pathway for is a social security benefit issue that we have here in Minnesota. You're in Minnesota, you retire, and you look over North Dakota, South Dakota, wherever, you know, or actually someplace that you want to live, like Arizona or Florida. I mean, you're not dealing with those same constraints. So We still tax Social incentive? Security income in Minnesota. You right. Social Security tax, it still gets a state tax on it yeah. for, for some people. So you get taxed on your tax money that you do. You've already paid taxes. Tax okay. So, yeah. So, okay. So, Social Security income, income tax cut, a permanent income tax cut. You're looking yeah. at the lowest rate. I mean, there's enough money. To do a lot more than that. I oh, mean, there, have you spoken for there is. five billion dollars or four billion dollars in permanent sustainable? I mean, there's other ways that we can we can look at this too. I mean, we've got the the UI trust fund that we have to uh, be taking care of. We've we've got a number of issues within the state of Minnesota that we, we really need to be seeing. Well, how can we do that? The other thing that we we've talked a lot about is we've got to put money towards um, our public safety. You know, we're going to get to that too. What are we the spend House, some money there too, but we'll talk. Uh, House Republican ideas on give it back. I mean, what are you guys talking we about? We absolutely House? want to give it back. This is the people's money. We have run consistent surpluses, which just means the people are overtaxed and they're sending in too much money. And so we want to give it back. I would support reducing the rates as well as um, completely eliminating the tax on Social Security. Minnesota is one of only 13 states that still taxes Social Security benefits. And it makes us uncompetitive. It makes our seniors flee. Overall, uh, according to the Tax Foundation, we have the uh, we we rank 45th for the worst tax climate in the country. So we are not being competitive with Bottom our peers. Yeah. We have the fourth highest corporate rate. We have the fifth highest income tax rate. Like this means people aren't going to want to build their businesses here, raise their families here, retire here. So we have to make ourselves more competitive. So is the House talking about the UI fund as well? I mean, and there's. There's a couple of things. The governor, I think, had put in his plan to, to, to repay the UI benefit uh, uh, fund that was depleted during yeah. COVID uh, because the government laid everybody off, essentially. Right. Um, but the big difference, I think, the big, the big talking point is going to be which funds are you going to use to do it? Are you going to use surplus funds from state income taxes that, that create the surplus or federal CARES Act money, which many, many other states use their federal CARES Act money to replenish their UI fund? I feel like the governor is going to say, oh, yeah, we want to do it, but we're going to use surplus money. And then I... I can preserve that UI or that uh, CARES Act money for later for my own use, for his preferred use. Right. No, I had a bill last spring before anybody else was talking about that to use the federal U the federal CARES money and the American Rescue Plan money to repay the debt to the federal government and replenish the trust fund. We have to do that. Government 
shut these businesses down through no fault of their own, through no economic downturn. So we have the responsibility to pay that back. And we should be using federal dollars. 31 other states use their federal money to do that. Our legislature reached back to the federal government and said, hey, how about you bail us out a little more? And they're like, uh, we already sent you the money. Yeah. Go use it for that. So. Yeah, I agree. I mean, anything to add on that? No, I mean, you guys are on that perfect. too. I mean, I think that's key because which fund you use is Absolutely. important. Absolutely. Uh, that's how you mentioned the hero checks or the, what they're called hero checks. It's frontline worker pay. And and you guys legislatively last session put $250 million into a pot and said, go try to figure out how to figure mm -hmm. it out. And it's stalemated. And, and, and like everything else in government, well, you didn't get it done at 250. So what's the solution? Kick it up to a billion. Surely we'll get it done. Yeah. I don't get this debate. I got to be honest. It's it's on the one hand, it seems like Republicans are saying we want to give more money, a bigger check to fewer people. And the Democrats are saying we want to give less money, but to more people. I don't I don't see a Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal philosophy coming through there. It's just two different ways to do it. Yeah. What What is keeping this from happening? And on the one hand, it's, it's a it is a rebate. You're giving money to taxpayers. You're giving money to taxpayers. Yeah. Is it an efficient way? I mean, I, I think one of the things that, that, you know, the center does is think about policy implications of our actions and, you know, look at, look at $250 million, you know, whether it goes out to a large group of people or, or a small group of people, I think the marginal impact of that money, it, it's not going to be a life or death situation. It's not going to, you know, for one month, maybe somebody can pay for an extra bill or something. Mm -hmm. To me, that's not you know, substantive change that we need to see in this state. That is such a one-off policy that to me, I, I mean, I'd be a little upset if, if somebody approached me and said, hey, here's a check for this. I hope all your problems are over, you know? So uh, for me, this is this whole debate has gone kind of off the rails. Yeah. And I hope that we can pull that back during the session and say, Let, let's do what we have to do. I know we made an agreement earlier, uh, but we got to revisit some of these things. And what's our policy and motive behind that now? We're all heroes. Give us our money back. Yeah. Well, I'm a politician. I don't think they oh, put me in that okay. yeah. category. So. Well, when you're laying concrete, you're a hero. How's that? <laughs> uh, uh, what you we're touching on one of the big different, one of the things I think of the themes from Tim Wallace's pr proposals, which more of it came out today. Uh, he's using a lot of one time money for the, the for give it back for the tax purposes and things. And then, and then his permanent spending, which is permanent surplus year after year, he's tying up in spending, perpetual spending. And so one of his one-time things, I want to challenge you a little bit on one of his one-time things. He's like, we'll get, we'll start a rural, a rural suburban fight here. Okay. Oh, so well, I'm actually good. from Crookston. So well, we well, have a lot coming. Right. Let's see who you're representing today. <laughs> I want to talk about broadband. So broadband funding, it seems to be around here. We, we show how much we care about rural Minnesota by how many dollars we put into broadband. And, and uh, in my rant, my suburban rant is that, is that, you know, people in Minnesota think they have a constitutional right to a certain high speed internet, uh, right. speed of internet service. And, you know, there's a trade-off, you know, I've been in your district, it's a beautiful place to live, you know, you've got a beautiful view out your backyard, and one of the trade-offs is you don't have high-speed internet at the, at the, at the kind of uh, um, access that we do in the city, so right. are we going to have another race to put more money into broadband, and, and, and I'll let the suburbs answer. Sure, I think the federal government has yeah, just poured money into it. I talked to a recent lobbyist who said, you know, just, you know, watch where you're putting all this money in the infrastructure stuff. You know, we're driving up the cost within the infrastructure. Broadband's one of the areas, you know, all that stuff. So we have to watch for that. Now, you know, one of the arguments that I would say, as far as principle, from a conservative perspective, it's hard to justify, you know, going out that extra mile or two to a farmhouse that sits out in the... Laying cable. Yeah, laying cable. But the great thing about it now is that we've got things like Starlink that are that are opening up opportunities that we knew that were going to be coming. Uh, but Elon Musk it took him, uh, you know, a few years to get it all together. But there are opportunities to get that broadband out to him, people, and you can see the appetite of you know urban and suburban folks moving out to their lake cabin or finding some new places. People are demanding that they're looking for that. It's not a constitutional right. But think of a place like Carlston that has a grass runway out there, and but they've got you know DigiKeys close by, they've got Mat Tracks, Polaris, Articat. You've got jobs, you have all these things that there's a community just ready to be built up and to grow, but we don't have what I would say basic infrastructure now of internet, you know, of air infrastructure, of good roads and bridges out that way. So for me, it's it's not a big uh, it's not a big downside to be given some of these sorts of things, this hard infrastructure that will be there for years and years and years, 
making a benefit in rural Minnesota. All right. Well, you, you, He's not suburb, actually going to get much of an argument here. Your suburban voters uh, <laughs> come into an Akron University of Emory broadband? Uh, we absolutely do. People are very surprised to find out that in areas of my district, in Dayton and Rogers, there is no broadband service. And I've been fighting for this for a couple of years because people think, because we're in Hennepin County, our residents are fully set and they are not. I had to work for a year with a provider to get internet service to a mobile home park in my district that was just in this weird, funky area that didn't have service. And those kids during online learning could, could not get access to their schoolwork. So I think it is a really important issue. I think it's a competitiveness issue. And so I think we have to be very careful about how we spend the money and be very um, rigorous and how the contracts are bid and how all of it is done, but it's really about Minnesota being competitive in all places of the state, including my district, to be able to create businesses and to attract. There's a lot of workers in throughout the state where th there could be new development, new businesses, if there was better access to broadband. But on the other hand, there's already uh, a lot of great work going on with some of the rural electric co-ops. They're already laying uh, fiber and cable, and they can partner with the broadband. They're doing this in the Winona area, and it's been fantastic. So I think I think we have to come up with innovative ways to do it efficiently, and that's the key. Yeah, there's just, it's been a lot of money over the last five years, and federally and state, so we'll, we're going to keep our eye on that. Today. So you, you got both of us agree, and <laughs> I not, think we're right. going to gang not up saying. on you, and not that, uh, not so the other way around. We'll, we'll have to see if we have a white paper on broadband spending. <laughs> there we go. Coming up forward. Um, all right, let's let's talk about another issue the governor's put forward today in permanent spending, um, this this uh, paid family leave. And I know the, the Democrats in the House uh, also have been talking a lot about this. So there's a big surplus. Let's institute a new program uh, of a paid family leave. And it sounds great, as a lot of liberal ideas do. They feel good. They sound good. Oh, we're the only country that doesn't do it. Oh, the only state that doesn't do it. Well, that's not true. There's not many states that have uh, paid leave. But it is, it is in fact, a, a new bureaucracy. And they, they're talking about using surplus funds you know, tens of millions of dollars, we have 7.7 .7 billion uh, to set up this new office, this new bureaucracy with hundreds of new state employees. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the dirty little secret about paid family leave, it sounds great, except that every employee and every employer will, will have a new tax that the surplus isn't going to be connected to. That's not, we're not going to use surplus dollars for that from these proposals. So, so are you hearing this in your district and what, what do you, how are we fighting back against this? Because it's such a feel good, sound good issue but, but the reality of it is, is not good for, for people. Right, in my district, I, I'm in an area with the I-94 West Chamber of Commerce, lots of small businesses, and this is really a big problem for them. They are already still struggling to recover from the government closures. Now they're facing the UI tax increase and they cannot absorb another huge tax increase. And the state cannot absorb into the baseline what this would cost. I, I believe the proposal last year was for an additional 445 FTEs, creating a whole new agency division. That's the size of our current department of education. $1.7 billion over two years. And they want to use surplus money for that, but that'll build into the base and that will eat up an incredible amount of the state budget. And I really think the mar market's work, I'm an economist, market's work as businesses are competing for labor, and this is one of the reasons that people choose to go find an employer who offers a paid a family leave benefit. Employers will offer it if they're able. And if they're not, to make them do it would crush them and we would see more small businesses close. And so I really think that um, we should let the markets work. Labor really um, has a lot of uh, pull right now yeah. in negotiating with employers. And so I think, you know, employees, employers who want to offer this benefit already can do so. Yeah, I mean, you got a big company in your district, DigiKey. Key. I mean, I assume they compete for employees, they recruit. I mean, is it better to let them handle this than, uh, than to have the government tell them what to do? Well, you might be surprised, but I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, push back a little bit. I actually have a paid family leave bill, but mine is more of a market base. So it, it goes along with what we're saying here is that, you know, if business want to offer that, that's great, but there currently isn't a program or a, a market, uh, you know, that you can go out and buy that sort of a product from. So our smaller business, if they wanted to be able to offer that, they can't do it. So instead of having a government mandate, I think we go right along with you uh, and say, okay, you can go out and buy this policy and we'll help you or whatever it is. 
but it's a market driven paid family leave instead of this mandate. And that helps with recruiting. You know, if you're a business that can afford that, you can offer those types of incentives, great. But if you're a business that can't, you know, if you're a mom and pop shop and you can't do it, why are you getting mandated to do it? And so where I, you know, I want to do something. If there's a demand, there's, there's people want it. Well, great. We, let's make a market for this where people can go out and get that. Uh, but let's not start forcing. And just from a political standpoint, that gives you something to be for. Uh, oh, I'm not always against every good sound. That's else. that's how I feel that, that we get cast. And, and maybe it's fair as conservatives. I mean, the, you know, conservative means you just you're not necessarily wanting a whole lot of change, which isn't a bad thing. We have the playing field laid out. Now you want to start moving all the, the goal lines and the boundaries of it. No, let's let's make sure that the playing field is even and, and so that people can access it. But let them play on their own terms. You know, so that's what we're looking for. All right. Another uh, proposal today from the governor, shocking, surprising, the, uh, the teachers union governor proposed a 2% increase in the funding formula for K-12 schools. Is that the number one thing you would do, uh, Representative, uh, looking at reforming education, making things better, closing the achievement gap, 2% increase on the formula? No, I mean, we just, we just gave a 2.5% yeah. for each year in the year that just started on July 1st, and this is not a, a budget year. So I do not support that. And, and the federal money is still coming through. We had SR 1, 2, and 3, the federal money, and it varied around the, around the state what some districts got. But I did, I did the numbers, and some of my districts got 900 extra per, per pupil. Minneapolis and St. Paul got between 7,000 and 9,000 extra in federal money per, per pupil. Per student. Yes. So, so there's, there's plenty of money out there right now for what we put in the budget last year and for how that will spend over the next two cycle, the two year budget we're currently in. We will revisit that and I'm sure there will be inflationary increases in the next two year budget cycle, but this is not a full budget year. And I think um, we have to provide a lot of support to our students. I think learning loss is the number one education issue that parents and families are really struggling with. I have a bill that I'm really focused on on K-3 literacy that I really hope we can get over the finish line this year. If kids are not reading by third grade, mm -hmm. it really sets a bad trajectory for their whole future. So I really think any uh, one-time money we have to put in education this session, we should really be putting it into programs that will really move the needle on achievement and um, addressing learning loss. Is there gonna be an appetite for more formula funding this year or in the Senate? Um, yeah, I think, uh, so let's, Let's look at it. I think as far as uh, education goes, I would fund education. I would I would increase it like crazy if we were doing education in Minnesota. What we're doing right now is indoctrination through our schools. We need changes. We need sub substantive changes within our schools, and we're not seeing that. We're seeing almost reverse uh, from the teachers union from different areas, where you know they're just hunkering down. And we're going to do the same thing over and over again, and we're going to continue to see those disparities grow and grow. We need something fundamentally different in the state of Minnesota where children can go and actually get an education. And I haven't seen that change it. I haven't seen that, uh, you know, where somebody's coming forth with a solution that will say, hey, we're going to change the way your kids are learning in, in our public schools. And I want to see more of that. You know, maybe the literacy thing is going to be a great thing, but but I don't know if, if they're in the mindset right now to actually start making transformational changes. And we need that. Nothing, you know, COVID has shown us nothing more than education needs a change. Um, we have to have more flexible, more anti-fragile type children. Hmm. And what we're doing right now is it's just kids are getting more and more fragile. Our parents are getting fragile. I mean, the, the whole system is we need a change there. All right. We might have more time for education later. Let's uh, let's move on to the big the big issue of the day. I think another big issue of the day: public safety. And I, I think there's a huge difference in the in the two sides down at the Capitol. And, it, and it's maybe changed a little bit, but the Democrats haven't really moved that much off of you know uh, we have a we have a problem with our police. We need police reform. We need um, we need more money for violence interrupters. You know the which we made fun of in our Golden Turkey uh, contest the uh, last time. Uh, but the, but the House Democrats, I think, and the governor have come out with a hundred million dollar package, you know, with, with the, which includes money for for this violence interrupter community group funding that that all that all kind of somehow they think reduce crime. 
Um, what's the what's the what's the Senate approach on public safety going to be? I think you have a press conference tomorrow. I assume this is going to be part of that press conference. Right. Maybe you can give us the, the the scoop. We're all in, and we're all in on public safety. We've seen the war on, on police, on law enforcement. Uh, we know what that's bringing to our state. You know, it, police won't fix the problems, of course. I mean, we, we run into the danger of of having an over police state, but. Right now, we clearly see what happens when you have an under police state, right? We don't need to defund. We need to refund those police and get them back out there in the communities, building the relationships again. Look, when they pull them out of the schools, you know, all of a sudden now kids are hearing from one side, the police are bad. They're terrible people. This is what happened in our town or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And they're not having interactions anymore with the police. And they're getting told all the time that they're terrible people. We need to change that. We need to change the directory within our law enforcement. From, from the state level? Can you we're going we're gonna to try to do grants, you know, trying to get law enforcement uh, trained up there. How can we make it more e easier for them? So let's let's do some grants. Let's figure out if we can get uh, more education into that. If we can get them into schools as far as, you know, earlier recruitment, trying to make sure that we open it up to that. I mean, there's there's all sorts of different ideas that are floating out there. But we understand that the proposals have to come from the communities and from law enforcement, how we can do this. And we are absolutely all in, and that's our top priority right now. I've seen this thing of fund, refund, don't defund, or you know, fund more police. I think Senator Miller said that yesterday, you know, we need more police. What is the state role in funding more police? I mean, that's a, usually a city function for most, or at least a county or a city function for most, most parts right. of the state. Well, take for example, the state patrol. Uh, for the first time, I think in their history, they haven't been able to fill a full class, uh, you know, in their cadet training uh, program right now. I mean, so there's there's really a lack of interest. So what we need to do is, is build up and really polish the image of police again in the state, make sure that they know it's an honorable profession, make sure kids are trying to get into that. And whatever we can do to do that, you know, um, making sure that the people are applying, they're actively seeking that sort of a thing, we're going to try to help as much as we can. You know, whether it's it's city police, state patrol, whatever it's going to be, uh, we have a role in that, and we're going to try to, to use our influence to do that. That's on the on the police side, on the infrastructure side. What about just crime fighting? And you know, we our latest magazine had cover was revolving the revolving door of justice, where these these guys are are committing crime, violent crime, crimes with guns, and then in getting arrested, the police are doing their job. And then show up in front of a judge and a prosecutor say, ah, let them go. And then they're right on the street doing it again. You know, are we looking at, you know, three strikes laws? Are we looking at, you know, tightening up mandatory minimum sentences so the judges have to actually do it? Is that the conversation in the House? What can we do to actually, you know, prevent crime and get these guys behind bars? Right. I think that's really one of the critical problems. I've done ride-alongs this fall in my communities and along with Hennepin County Sheriff deputies. And that's their biggest frustration is they do their point of the the job and they arrest uh, these criminals and then that's catch and release. They know they're going to see them and they see the same repeat offenders all the time in our communities with, and it's retail theft, it's carjackings, it's felony level violence. It's terrible. And so I had a bill last year that I'll continue to push for that increases the minimum sentences for um, felonies with a gun. And it also um, for people who knowingly, uh, distribute guns to people who are prohibited. So straw purchasers, mm -hmm. it increases penalties for that. Right now, that's a gross misdemeanor. Right. And so prosecutors think it's not worth their time. So we have to make that a felony level crime. Some of these cases we've seen, you know, the straw purchasers had purchased 30, 40 guns. It, it was clear they knew what they were doing and they should face severe consequences for that. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity to strengthen the statutes to have more penalties for these uh, re, uh, repeat offenders and so that we can keep them off the streets. And, and really it's, it's in the interest of our communities to, especially when it's juveniles, they're not prosecuting them. But then these kids, their parents might not even know they get the ticket. They don't show up in court and it's a way to intervene before they get involved in much more serious crime. So I think we also have to look at how we can, um, intervene more, more quickly in juvenile cases mm -hmm. and, and redirect those kids. So, that sounds great. The message on the tax give it back sounds great. People watching this this webinar are saying, "Wow, you know, we got all the ideas, we got all the answers. You think the people, the public is with us? What, what? Let's just talk about for a minute. What, what, what causes this not to get done? I mean, what is the what is the poker game down here? You've got a Democrat governor, obviously a Democrat House, a Republican Senate. Um, you know, I talked to somebody the other day who said, 
well, if nothing gets done, it would be a victory, you know, because then all the money would still be there and we can just deal with it after the next election. I, I think sitting here in January as the session begins next week, that, that's kind of a failure attitude. I mean, with a $7 billion surplus, I mean, what, 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 how do we get something done? I'll point to you because you're the majority or the deputy majority leader. I mean, what, how, do we, how do we convince the governor and the House that this is the right thing to do? How do we, how do we get this done? Yeah, well, you could could say I'm the former temporary majority. Responsibility is on you. (laughs) So it it is interesting because, you know, we've got constituents at home that are saying, well, why can't we do, you know, X, Y, and Z? Let's say it's the UI fund uh, that they want to get done because they're a small business. So they want to see those premiums reduced. Well, you know, the Democrats are going to attach on to that, uh, you know, paid family leave and say, well, fine, if you want to get that done, we're going to do paid family leave or something like that. And I think the idea that that we can't just come down here and by fiat say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to cut taxes because I, a lot of constituents have the idea that we have that ability as legislators to do some of these major actions. But we've got to get you know, a majority of the House and the Senate and the governor to sign on. And when you come from radically different areas, your principles, your values, your interests are radically different. It's so hard to come together and have those compromises on things that we want to do. One of the problems we're going to run into this year is the governor, like you alluded to, has that $1.15 billion sitting in his back pocket that if we don't come to some sort of an agreement on how that money is going to be spent, he gets to take it out and just go like this all election season mm-hmm. for his base, his pet projects, whatever he wants to do. So there's and, an incentive. And the federal government set that up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It was, that's absolutely. the way the federal government gave money. to. You have a lot of power to governors with that, that federal money. Yeah. Yeah. So he's got a nice little kitty. So it would be in his interest in many regards to not see a whole lot of action, too. So we'd be kind of playing right into him. So we got to be really careful on how we do this. If we can get wins. Boy, we're going to go after him. We're going to go after him hard. What, so. what advice do you give, Representative Robinson, to, to people watching, like how to make an impact? How to what's the right message besides you know give me my tax money back? Um, what do they what do they need to do to convince the governor and your colleagues in the house? Um, I really think we need the public to be engaged. This is your money. This is your state. I mean, I'm in the minority. My bills often don't even get a hearing. And we have these fights on the floor, we argue, but at the end of the day, the math isn't there. But if legislators hear from their constituents from all over the state to say, I really want you to return the surplus, I really want you to fund UI, I really want you to make sure there's permanent tax relief, not just these wealth checks. It's really the people putting pressure on their legislators and the governor's office to do the right thing that will move the needle because in the House, at least, we don't have the votes to win anything on it on its on its face. So we need to get to switch some of these um, legislators who are in marginal districts who really have to really pay attention to their voters. You mentioned marginal districts. I want to get to that next. And redistricting. We promised that we talk about that in the, in the uh, marketing for this event. And uh, we're, we're approaching Q and A time. So if you have a question, uh, use the Q and A button and uh, drop it in, and I'll. I'll let uh, represent or Senator uh, Johnson talk about redistricting because you chair the redistricting yeah. committee in the Senate. Yeah. I mean, the clock is ticking on your timeline. February fifteenth, the legislature and the governor have to agree on a map. It's not looking good for that agreement. Maybe tell us, just walk us through sure. the process for what what we're looking at in the next few weeks as this new map comes out. Sure. And over the fifty years, you know, it, it really has gone to the courts uh, over fifty years, which. It's a legislative process, but typically it's hard to get agreement amongst the legislators and the governor to do that. So we're keeping that open pipeline pipeline between us and the House. And so seeing if we can come to an agreement there. If not, if it fails, uh, February 15th is the cutoff date for that. Uh, the courts have had a parallel process. So they're working on their maps too. They're getting things done behind the scenes. After February 15th, they're free to release that, uh, their map. So, you know, sometime uh, late February, early March, we should have the final districts if the legislative process uh, breaks down. And so uh, it should be interesting to see, you know, where the lines go, where where the movement is. Uh, Of course, we're hoping for the least amount of movement. What the Democrats really need to do, uh, they've got to break the principles that the court has used and is using in order to get little spikes and, and nooks and crannies out from the metro. And then they've got a locked in substantive 
uh, you know, majority for sure. Uh, but what we're saying is let's do it the way that you principally laid it out and you've done it in the years before. And we've had great maps that have, you know, bipartisan, they've switched back and forth the house and the Senate over the last 10 years. Nobody can say it's a jerry-rigged map. I was going to ask that. Do you think maps in Minnesota, I mean, the courts have mostly drawn them. I mean, we hear about gerrymandering and all over the country, yeah. North Carolina, well, these weird districts. Yeah, everything. North Carolina, Illinois. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, you name it. You don't, you don't, you feel like maps generally have been fair? Generally, I think they've been very fair. Now, I'm sure there's certain districts that folks have, you know, concerns with and things like that. But I think overall, um, you know, I talk to Democrats, talk to Republicans. They say, for the most part, they've been fairly fair uh, over the last 50 years. So uh, I think if they continue in that vein, we won't have a whole lot of complaints and, and problems in this state. Okay. Well, let's let's get to questions. Uh, uh, I've been looking at my phone and some good questions have come in with some topics that I wanted to talk about anyway. So we can do two for one. One first question comes in on bonding. We haven't talked about bonding. Yeah. So traditionally the odd year is a budget year. The even year is a non-budget year, but we do a capital bonding or a borrowing bill for projects all over the state. Uh, a pretty good question. State bonding requests have reached an obscene level. <laughs> These are the requests, right? Um, what bounds or rules would you suggest to bring the tendency to find others to pay for our expenses under control? So, uh, Representative Robbins, you're in the minority in the House, but the, a bonding bill in order to borrow money, the state requires a supermajority. So, Republicans ultimately have to support a bonding bill in order for it to get out of the House and get to the Senate. What, what kind of discussions have you guys been having in terms of parameters for a bonding bill, size, dollar amount, and what kind of projects are there? You know, we really haven't had any discussions yet, but I'm sure it'll be a hot topic when we do reconvene next week. Um, my personal view is that it, that bonding is important and it, they need to be projects that are statewide or at least very significant regional significance because I do think that's a tool the government has to help fund projects. That being said, I think the amount of the bonding bill proposals, historically they were usually around or just under a billion dollars. And we blew through that last time. I heard they're talking- 1.9 billion 1. we did point, last time? Yes, right? I mean, and now it's two over billion. two. I mean, we, can't, we have to ratchet it back and make sure that the projects are really worthy, that they're really impactful. And so I would, I would guess um, they're, I can't speak for all my colleagues, obviously, but I think that it takes 11 Republican votes to get a bonding bill out of the Senate or mm -hmm. out of the House. And I just don't see that there being support for something at that enormous level. Yeah. And what about in the Senate? I mean, you, you've, you've served on the bonding committee before. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I mean, you're not no, I, you I haven't done that. Yet, um, so. You know, it, bonding is not free. It's borrowing money from the future. And we have, you know, at any given time, we have over $10 billion in debt. People don't know that the state of Minnesota has over $10 million, $10 billion, I'm sorry, in debt at any one time. And the debt service is a big part of the state yeah. budget and it keeps growing, growing. With, these, with these big bill, bonding bills. Yeah. So it's not free and it does add to future spending. Yeah. I mean, is that is that pressure at all being felt in your caucus or is everybody getting their projects in there and let's go? Yeah. It's just a Christmas tree. Let's just go <laughs> home after that. No, I, don't, don't so, depress us, please. <laughs> No, no. So I was one People of three. People believe that, by the way. That's I asking. was one of three that voted against one of the, the bonding bills during my first term here, which uh, was tough to do. But uh, so I, I take it very seriously, the bonding bill. It's not just a big Christmas tree that you get to take your presents under. But the problem with that is that, the, like you say, the debt service really impacts our cash flow. So we are doing great right now. The state's doing great. The world's doing great, whatever. Um, we've got money all over the place. And we're going to throw in another few billion dollars for more projects. And then next year, when you know the stock markets continues to crash or whatever is going, we're still re responsible for that debt service payment. That's cutting into anything that we are able to do then as a government for our schools, for our public safety, for our economy. And that's really putting us into a really liability issue. So we got to be careful. They're saying, well, we've got all this capacity. Well, we have that right now. But what about... In 10 years or five years when things are really bad around here. What are you going to be saying then? And we're cutting your schools and we're, we're doing all these different things just to make the ends meet again. And we still have to make that debt service payment. Okay, here's a, here's a good question. Back on the crime issue, um, uh, this, this uh, writer suggests that culture is the foundational issue. If that is true, how can we use policy tools to enhance a positive law-abiding law culture? For example, what can we do to help reduce family fragmentation? I mean, the breakdown of the family is a huge contributor to 
a lot of this, the, the, the roots of, of the crime right. we're seeing. And I'll throw it to you first. I mean, what is there? A, is there a culture thing, and how, how can the legislature influence culture? Well, I think it really does. We incentivize cultural changes. You know, whether it's if through welfare checks or if it's uh, you know just the way that we've set up our uh, divorce system, the different things that we've done, we've we've made it easier to be a fragmented family than it ever was before. You know, with the great safety net. Now, I'm not saying take away the safety net and the families will be back together again, but I'm saying that it's very, very easy and, and it's almost incentivized, you know, to, you know, do what you want and be free and, and whatever um, without consequences. And we're living with the repercussions of that right now. Now, I don't know, you know, there's different policy things that we can do, but. If you're thinking about economics, you know, by incentivizing people to do certain things, you can change a culture. And we run, you know, every day that we're throwing out bills, we're changing culture through the incentives and, and through the laws that we are constantly putting out there. So we, we do need to think about those repercussions. And I think we see them right now. Yeah, repercussions. I mean, what, what are you hearing in your community? You represent a suburban community in Havoc County not that far from the core cities. I mean, is, is the crime coming your way? Or is it a top concern for your constituents? And it absolutely is. And people want to see consequences for violating the law. Rule of law um, is only supported when, when people have consequences if laws are broken. And so we need to stop catch and release. We need to prosecute people who violate the law. We need to not let them out on early probation or you know, if they, uh, you know, violate again while they're on probation, then they should have a consequence, not just say, oh, they, they didn't mean it, it was a technicality. Mm -hmm. But also we need to have accountability um, at the top for our Hennepin County Sheriff, who, uh, you know, just, you know, very culture. sadly was yeah. in a very serious car accident. And I called last week for him to resign. And I wish him all the best in his recovery, but the public, sees that, that he got a very quick deal with no consequences. And the public is really frustrated with that in Hennepin County. So I think if we don't have consequences for uh, public officials and um, our leaders at the top, it's hard to expect the public to also bear consequences. So it has to be across the board. Everyone has to have the same consequences regardless of their position. Is there a, is there a financial string? One of the questions here is like, how do we get police judges and DAs on the same page? before we give any of them, give them more dollars? I mean, do we hold back funds? I mean, I mean, the district attorneys are, are a county-based thing, but certainly the judiciary gets funded by the legislature. I mean, they've already got their two-year budget, but is it a funding thing maybe? Potentially, I heard Senator Limmer, who is head of the Senate Judiciary Committee mention that um, that could be a way to get them to uh, be more diligent in prosecuting crime. I think also it's, really important for um, the public to speak out. And when it's time to vote for judges, and maybe that's a role the center could play, is help outline who, who are the judges who have been letting yeah. people off. People, people want to vote for good judges. They just don't necessarily know how to find the information. So empowering the public to vote for good county attorneys, to vote for good judges, is really important. That's a really good idea. We should really get on that. Wait a minute, we already are. That's coming soon from, the, from American Experiment. You will see that in future magazines and future uh, AmericanExperiment.org uh, content uh, okay. specifically. Yeah, public, though, I've definitely. had a lot of people ask me, well, how do we know who the good judges are? How do we know who, who's going to be a good Sorry. candidate for, as you know, Hennepin County Attorney uh, Mike Freeman is, is yep. stepping down, so we're going to have a new race yep. in Hennepin County. People are really anxious to find out good information about candidates. Because even you and I struggle at finding out, you know, well, who is a good candidate, right. even the judges, because there isn't really a record that's laid out. There is an opponent to hold them, you know, accountable to that necessarily, you know, most races. So well, we really, I, you know, if you guys are on that, mm -hmm. wonderful. Thank you for the work that you guys are doing. A question back to education. And you mentioned this a little bit um, when you talk about what is being taught, not so much. Um, is there a bill to promote transparency for school districts to post their curriculum online? This is a, a, a agenda item that the center has put forward. Um, what, what are you hearing on education from your parents and this, this whole critical race theory that's been, been, been out all over the schools and the transparency and school boards shutting down public comment periods? I mean, what's going on in there? What can we do at the state level on, on those topics? Right. There's a lot we can do, I believe. Um, parents are really frustrated. Parents feel like they are 
not being seen as a partner in their children's education, that they're being kept at bay to really know what's being taught in the classroom, to be know, know why classrooms are being shut down for distance learning. I've had a lot of parents reach out to me who are frustrated with what's going on in the schools. And I believe my colleagues on the education committee, I don't serve on that committee, but I believe they are working on a package of reforms that would make sure that uh, parents have the right to see the curriculum and the syllabuses from different uh, classes at different levels, know what books are in the library. So I think people are wanting to empower parents with the information and also, you know, more opportunities for parents to have their money follow their child rather than, you know, funding the system. We want to be funding kids and funding outcomes. So I think I don't know the specifics of all these uh, package reform packages that are coming out, but I know those are a lot of things that our colleagues are talking about. Yeah. Money follows the kids. So is it is it time for school choice finally? Can we convince this governor that, that school choice is the option? Can we get enough parents behind it? Is the Senate the Senate's been good on choice? They passed it a few yeah. times. Is it going to continue? I mean, I don't think we're going to be able to convince the governor unless the state of Minnesota comes, you know, or, or the teachers union finally wakes up and says, yes, we need to do something different here. Uh, but I don't foresee uh, that necessarily happening. But yes, it is something that uh, we've been very passionate about. We have a great chair, uh, Roger Chamberlain, who's extremely passionate uh, about education, about our children's future. And so he's putting together, you know, a package uh, that's just trying to address some of these things and, and you know, figuring out uh, where the dollars go is a big part of that. Uh, a question back on taxes. Um, I agree that the $7.7 .7 billion surplus should be returned to the taxpayer. But we also need to maintain a balanced budget long term. How much is it one? How much of the 7.7 .7 billion is one time versus ongoing? Permanent tax breaks become an ongoing expense. Uh, be fiscally prudent is the is the caution there. But do we know that? Have you guys talked about that? Like the, the, the surplus is 7.7 .7 billion, but is it it is sort of one time versus permanent? Yeah, and I think the, the numbers, and you probably know this a little bit better, but the numbers have been, you know. Uh, with the federal dollars that have gone out to individuals and whatnot, that's made a big impact and probably a spike in spending uh, and different things so that will probably skew the numbers upwards for a temporary time as well. I don't know if you can measure that effect uh, to any certainty right now, uh, but you might be, you know, a lot of that is ongoing. So we have to watch that. Um, but yeah, I forgot what was the second part of that? that question well just being prudent you know with, with, well, right because you don't overextend i mean i, I think and that's that, and that's the other part that, that i was thinking that was we do have that rainy day fund that um, is sitting there i think it's close to three billion dollars in that fund right now uh, which is the statutory maximum currently uh, that we have so you know we've got a backdrop for a little while there yeah we see that in our polling a lot we ask you know what you do with the surplus and people say well save it for a rainy day well, folks, the, the 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 rainy day fund that Minnesota has is the strongest it's in the history of the state and one of the strongest in the country. So, I mean, the, the state savings account is in really good shape. And if we if, if we had a rainy day, it would have been COVID. And it turns out we didn't even have to tap it very much during COVID. So I think people need to start thinking about their own savings accounts, um, which are not as, as good shape as the as the state's. Any 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 thoughts well, on that? And I can jump in. I mean, I agree that we shouldn't spend the one-time money for tax cuts. It has to be the ongoing portion of the surplus. But there's several billion. My understanding is of the seven is the ongoing money. So that's available to use for tax cuts. And I think that would do the most good from an economic perspective. If we are permanently lowering people's taxes, they have more money that they can spend as they see fit, which will drive economic growth and spur business development. So I think. The long run that will generate more taxes down the road if we have a good strong tax policy here that's competitive so i think it's in our interest to do it but secondly that assumes that government stays the same and that our obligations stay the same and we really need to start thinking about shrinking government there are so many programs that are outdated i i know that there are ways we could take a comprehensive look at efficiencies. I was on a, on a, on a meeting a couple of days ago where they talked about all the efficiencies from people working from home. Great. Let's capture that. Let's book that. And let's try and shrink the footprint of government so that the, the private sector can do more. And I think, um, so we have to look at both, not only just the, the tax side, but we have to look at reducing spending and re at, or at least reducing the growth of government. It's on yeah. an unsustainable 
paths it's, to it's almost impossible to have a discussion down here with a 7.7 billion dollar surplus about low, slowing right. the growth in government. There won't be any discussion just, about just, it, but we, I want the public I'm to glad realize we, it we up have and, to keep you know, thinking about that. Somebody just put a question: How about being prudent with our spending? We spend right. way too much, so thank you. Wait, you, but you know that we're in Minnesota. Yeah, right? I know, I know. So that's a that's a challenge. The other hypocrisy you're going to hear is when we talk tax cuts and permanent tax cuts. We'll hear from the other side that. Oh, we got to be careful, you know, because the economy takes a downturn. They won't be sustainable. Instead, let's put two percent on the funding formula for education and and fund childcare and fund uh, you know paid family leave and all these other things, which again equally unsustainable. Right. Um, actually, more unsustainable because what you just mentioned, the tax cuts are actually going to have a stimulative effect in the economy and actually bring back money, whereas the spending is just going to be spending that's just going to go up. But you're going to hear that huge hypocrisy uh, out, of the, out of the governor, for, for instance. And then could we also talk a little bit, too, about with the government growth, the amount of regulation that is hitting our state right now, it, it is just, I don't think people understand the impact that is. You know, you guys are a great write-up on the California clean car emission mm -hmm. issue right now. We're talking about biodiesel. California just uh, stated that they don't want any liquefied fuel anymore. Yeah. Are we going to have to follow that too here in Minnesota? Drive our battery operated cars my 325 miles down here in the wintertime? It's not going to happen. You know, it, it's or pull that. a trailer to your job site, you know? <laughs> that's, you know? that's not going to happen. Yeah. But I mean, the regulation that's, that's currently working on our farms, it's driven out business. I mean, I can name off the, you know, off the top of my head some major five, Fortune 500 type companies that we've had. In Minnesota, uh, you know, trucking and the fishing and all that stuff that we had uh, lined up for Minnesota that are gone because of the regulations within Minnesota. And it's, it's, I mean, you guys have seen it at all. I mean, it's just, to me, I think that's right up there well, with, with home. I just read that Marvin Windows is expanding huge in Fargo. So they yep. could be expanding in your district. That's they, in your district. That's what they, you know, if, if they said, they told me, if we cut down regulation, we can cut down on our tax rate right now, we're at fourth in the U.S. on tax rate. You know, we'd love to expand here. We'd love to open up the job opportunities for Northwest Minnesota. We'd love to do that. Our family's here. We've invested here. Mm -hmm. But we're going to have to create jobs over in Fargo. Mm -hmm. Hormel did something similar. They built a new plant out in South Dakota. Yeah. And we're and we're trying to uh, lure over Jeff Bezos and all those people with billions of dollars of incentive. Well, let's do it right here with our hometown companies. They're great companies. They invest in the communities. I know them. Our our kids play sports together. You know why are you giving it to Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates who uh, have a different agenda for this state? Yeah, we are almost uh, out of the time. Uh, maybe to wrap up, uh, we we talk about a lot of big global issues. Is there anything small? Not that's not in a bad way, but a more narrow focused legislation that you're championing uh, for your district or in the, in the process that you want to talk about or feature or mention? You know, I actually do. A, a, most of my best ideas come from my constituents. And um, so I have a lady who I door knocked who had a problem with um, the way that third party payer assistance for her drugs was applied to her deductible. And it's in the fine print, but it's not in the benefit summary. And so based on not understanding how that would work, she chose a different health plan she thought would save money and actually doubled her cost mm -hmm. and was really hit hard. So this surprise billing, but also how it's treated in the bill summary so that the individual consumer can do more to understand their impact of this third party uh, payer assistance. So I'm hoping that I'll get that bill through this year. It's there's no opposition. It just is something we need to get yeah. done. And, and yeah. just they already provide that level of detail in the in the detail of the health benefit. They just don't put it in the summary and it would help consumers. So I'm hoping that's a very small All thing, right. but it means a lot to real consumers. That's the kind of stuff that gets done around here. That's that's good to hear. You mentioned your paid family bill. What else you got uh, maybe locally or yeah, we I mean we've got a number of different things going on, but you know, the biggest thing is how are we helping Minnesota? We are laser focused. I am laser focused on economics of Minnesota, the education of Minnesotans, and then our safety. So those are, that is all I'm going to be working after redistricting. Mm -hmm. That's all we're going to be working on is trying to figure out solutions that revolve around. Look, Minnesota's a beautiful state. We love, we love this state. We love the people in here. Let's try to figure out how we can make it work. Go back to the basics and just make it work again. All right. Senator Mark Johnson, Representative Kristen, Kristen Robbins, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope you give it a little bit of hope. Uh, it's going to be okay this session. And we hope you learned something and hope it was a little bit of fun too. Uh, I'm Bill Walsh. We'll sign up from here. Thanks a lot.